Hi, this is Baina. Thanks to the organizers for the chance to speak. Um, so this is a talk about uh, cohomology of certain arithmetic groups. Uh, so the main arithmetic groups that um, I'm going to be interested in are lattices in SOPQ. So the, this group is uh, matrices in the SL P plus Q Z, which preserve a certain um, bilinear form. Which I'll write like this. So here IPQ is um, a matrix block diagonal with, uh, here you have the P by P identity and the negative Q by Q identity. I'm writing a little too big, sorry. Um, Oh, sorry, bear with me here as I get used to this. Okay, so these are the, the groups and um, let me just go ahead and state the main theorem. Uh, so I proved this in 2017. Uh, so let's take P less than or equal to Q. Um, Let's assume P plus Q is at least three to avoid some uh, trivial cases. And let's say P is odd. Uh, so this will be an important assumption. Then for every N at least one, there exists a finite index subgroup, gamma in this group, SOPQZ, uh, so that it has a lot of cohomology in degree P. So the Pth um, cohomology of gamma, rationally, the dimension of this vector space is at least N. Um, so P here, the cohomology is it's appearing in degree Q, uh, P, which um, is like the real rank or the Q rank of, of this uh, arithmetic group. Um, right, so the, the statement of the theorem is if you, you can make the cohomology in degree P as large as you want by passing to finite index subgroups. Um, so let me make some remarks about this and, and give some context. Um, so first, let me just say that uh, the, the particular finite index subgroup can be made a little more precise. So if you're given um, L prime, then uh, you can take gamma to be a congruent subgroup um, gamma l to the n which is uh, the intersection of this arithmetic group with the congruent subgroup of SLNZ so the kernel of reduction mod L to the N. Um, for N sufficiently large. Okay, so depending on this capital N, you can choose little N large enough so that these subgroups have um, large um, cohomology, lots of cohomology. Um, okay, I have limited space here. I'm going to just make more remarks here rather than go to a new page so that you can still see the theorem. Um, a second remark, 
about some related work. So Milson and Raghunathan in the 80s proved a similar result um, for um, co-compact lattices. in SOPQ. Um, here when P is even. So P and Q satisfy this same, these same inequalities, but um, their result works for, for P even. Um, and, and here P is odd. So there's a little difference there. Um, and yeah, so let me just point out that this is a, a not co-compact, it's, or typically you say non-uniform. Um, uh, okay. Um, another, another remark, another thing to say about this. Um, so this is, the cohomology produced here is, is um, non-stable cohomology. So let me compare this to what Burrell stability says. And for simplicity, let's just say we focus on the case P is equal to Q. Um, so in this case, in low degrees, Borel tells you what the cohomology of any finite index subgroup of this group is. Um, so for in degrees less than or equal to P minus two, um, so in this range, the cohomology of gamma rationally is isomorphic to the cohomology of this larger group, SOPQZ, rationally, that's important. Um, And this is a polynomial ring with um, generators in degrees of 4K. So in this range, the cohomology looks like a polynomial ring and it's uh, completely independent of the particular lattice you choose. Um, so in contrast, the theorem is about in degree P. Um, and P is odd, and um, there's lots of non-trivial things here. Um, and right, so the classes that are being produced by this main theorem, um, well, in addition to lying outside of the stable range, they're not in the algebra generated by these stable classes. So, so this is the stable. Um, because this stable classes, it's things have even degrees. And so even in the algebra that they generate, you don't find things in this odd degree here. Um, okay, let me make one more comment about the theorem. And then I wanna discuss uh, some applications. Um, so the last thing under remarks, so these classes, um, in the theorem, um, well, so they have a, an interpretation. Um, in terms of uh, characteristic classes, uh, let me say, so they have the interpretation as characteristic classes. Um, and in terms of instruction, uh, obstruction theory.
uh, and I want to say something about this a little bit later. Um, but okay, so there's there's some the way these are constructed is is um, gives you some indication for what they are as characteristic classes of bundles of a certain sort. Uh, Okay, so that sort of leads into the um, the applications, which is about characteristic classes of, of bundles. Uh, so let's first take, okay, so the first application is to, well, okay, so first let me introduce some notation. So W, G, 4K, these are, um, manifolds, which are connect sums of products of spheres. Uh, products of even dimensional spheres. If, if this was S1 times S1, then this would just be a genus G surface. Um, and so we can consider the diffeomorphism group of WG, which acts on the homology, uh, let me put this, oops, let me, let me put this over here. This acts on the middle dimensional homology, preserving the intersection form. And um, this group is commensurable with S O G G Z. The intersection form on this product of spheres is not quite uh, this diagonal thing, but um, up to. Um, but okay, so th these groups are commensurable. Um, so if you take, okay, so some notation: if if gamma is finite index um, subgroup here, I'm going to denote um, alpha inverse of gamma by, uh, oh, here's, let me call this map alpha. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna write diff gamma WG as alpha inverse of gamma. Here, uh, this map is, is surjective. So if gamma is finite index, you get a finite index subgroup of the diffeomorphism group here. Um, okay, so the, the main theorem tells you that it, you can find gamma, which have some non-trivial cohomology. And um, well, then you might ask if um, the, the cohomology here pulls back to something non-trivial here, which would give you characteristic classes for bundles with fiber, uh, this manifold. And indeed, this is the case. So a theorem, which um, is basically due to Berglund and Madsen, uh, but there's a, a little bit more that has to be said, which uh, I worked out with Manuel Kronick. Um, so if K is at least two, so these are in the, in the high dimensional setting, then the induced map on cohomology of classifying spaces, rational coefficients, Um, is injective for I at most 2K. Okay, so in particular, if, um, so the classes in, in the main theorem are in, the non-trivial classes here are in degree G. Um, let me just put a G here. Um, and so if, if G is, is at most 2K, or I guess you could say if, if the dimension is large compared to the genus, then you get non-trivial classes here. Um, so let me draw a little, another schematic, which um, sort of relates this to what we knew before um, about the cohomology of, of these groups.
Um, so again, there's a lot that's known about known in a certain stable range, so uh, which is roughly g over two. Um, and this, and this is described in work of Galatius and Randall Williams. Um, and uh, the, well, okay, so now I'm telling you that there's some other stuff in, in degree G, at least when G is odd, um, for certain values of gamma. Um, so the theorem gives you uh, that you have lots of stuff here. And let me point out again that similar to um, the previous schematic I drew like this, the, all the stable classes have uh, even degree. And so these classes similarly uh, as before are outside of, they're not in the algebra generated by the stable classes. Um, I mean, even if they, this, they were in even degree, there's, well, okay, you could argue in a different way to conclude, but uh, here you can say quite quickly that they're not in the algebra generated by stable classes. Um, okay, so that's the, the first application. Um, I, I want to mention a second application. Um, so let's take M now to be a four manifold, which is a K3 surface. So as a smooth manifold, these are all diffeomorphic to any one K3 surface. And one example is uh, to take, well, you can take any um, quadric in uh, CP3, smooth. Um, okay, so this is some special four manifold. Its diffeomorphism group again acts on the middle homology, preserving the intersection form. And in this situation, um, this group is commensurable to uh, O319. So the, the intersection form on a K3 um, has type 319. Um, okay, so again, we can ask a similar question. So we have like um, subgroups, finite index subgroups here that have lots of cohomology and do they give you some cohomology for uh, some characteristic classes for these types of bundles? Um, so here there's uh, work of Jean Syracuse, which uh, helps answer this question. Well, it gives a partial answer, in fact, it won't completely answer. So um, if gamma is in, um, there's a finite index subgroup here, and we look at um, the induced map on cohomology as before. Um, oh, but there's an important difference. So it's not quite as before. So here, uh, instead of classifying space of the diffeomorphism group, I'm just gonna put the uh, group of components, the mapping class group. Uh, this is injective, uh, in fact, for all I. Um, right, so combining this with the uh, main theorem tells you that there exists some non-zero um, classes Z in degree three. 
So here P is three. Um, of uh, this, um, the classifying space of the mapping class group, or cohomology of the mapping class group. Um, right. So there's some interesting cohomology here. Um, and A remark about this. So now you, you, I mean, really you'd like to understand if this class Z pulls back further to uh, the cohomology of the classifying space of the, the diffeomorphism group. Um, and I don't know the answer to that question, um, but um, let me just remark that if the answer is yes, then uh, So if Z lifts to H3 of B diff, uh, then there exists a K3 bundle over a three manifold uh, with no fiber wise Einstein metric. Um, okay, so this would be an interesting consequence if, if one was able to show that this class in fact, in fact lifts to the diffeomorphism group. Um, and um, let me just remark further that uh, in contrast, Donaldson showed that um, for a K3 bundle over the circle, so if your base is only one dimensional, then um, you always have a fiber-wise uh, Einstein metric. Um, okay, but like I said, I don't know whether or not uh, this class, any of these classes Z lift to uh, um, diffeomorphism group. All right. Um, Okay, so now um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the main theorem itself. Um, and there's two, I think there's maybe two main questions that you might ask um, just given the statement of the theorem. Um, so where do these classes come from? And what do they measure? I mean, I'm, I'm telling you that there are these applications to characteristic classes of manifold bundles. So what are these, as characteristic classes, what are they telling you about fiber bundles? Um, and then the second question is, um, well, why are they non-zero? Um, so, I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna focus on this first question and explain how to construct characteristic classes um, from the point of view of characteristic classes. And this will answer this, this first question, um, how to construct these particular classes. And then, but it won't at all be obvious from what I say, and I don't think I'll have time to say anything about um, why they're non-zero. Um, so there, there's, of course, you can construct a characteristic class by showing that it's non-zero, non-trivial is, is a different um, matter which requires extra work. Um, okay, but for, I think um, it's interesting to see like what these classes are and what they're measuring. So I'm gonna focus on, on that. All right, so that brings, me to the second part of the talk. 
Um, so characteristic classes for, so I'm gonna describe a construction of characteristic classes for vector bundles, um, vector bundles. Uh, with a lattice. So this will become clearer in a second. So the, the plan, so, um, right. So actually I'm gonna switch it, it, from the point of view of explaining this, it's, it's easier to switch from SOPQ to just SLNZ. So what I'm gonna do is um, for certain, uh, finite index subgroups of SLNZ, I'm gonna define a characteristic class, characteristic classes um, that live in degree n minus one, which again is the Q rank. Um, and they're characteristic classes for vector bundles. Um, well, I mean, how do you think of this as a characteristic class? It's a characteristic class for vector bundles um, with structure group um, gamma. And a similar construction will work if, uh, so let me just say similar construction. For S O P Q. Z. Okay, so, uh, so let's start. So th there's an input in this construction which will allow you to produce many different characteristic classes. Um, and that is to fix a decomposition of Rn into a, um, a hyperplane and a line. So here, um, dimension of L is one. And uh, I want this to be defined over Q. So these are rationally defined subspaces. Um, okay, and, and so now uh, what I want to do is given, start with a bundle So vector bundle with structure group in SLNZ. Um, and uh, try to build a characteristic class. So the way this, right. So having structure group in SLNZ tells me in particular that uh, this bundle admits a fiber-wise lattice. So um, in each fiber, there's a copy of Z to the N um, so that it's this sub space or subset is, is invariant under the monodromy. Um, right. And then, uh, well, if you have a bundle like this, then you can, well, extend the structure group to SLNR and uh, reduce it to the maximal compact subgroup SON, which, which amounts to choosing a fiber-wise inner product on the bundle. And roughly, um, okay, so from this setup, I'm gonna build a characteristic class. And roughly what the characteristic class is um, measuring is uh, whether or not you can choose, so there's many ways to reduce the structure group to SON, which the, a given bundle has many fiber-wise inner products. But the question is, is there a way to choose this Q in a way which is compatible with this lattice structure in a particular way, which I'm gonna make precise right now. Um, so the key definition is, um, okay, so we say that this pair, P and L, this decomposition is Q orthogonal at a point B in the base. So you suppose you fix some Q, fiber-wise inner product. Um, 
So roughly, I just want to say if uh, this decomposition is orthogonal with respect to Q, with respect to the inner product Q on that particular fiber. Um, but there's not a canonical identification of the fiber as this decomposition, so you have to say something more. Um, okay, so let me say this like this. Um, so if there exists an isomorphism phi from Rn relative to Zn into the fiber over B relative to the lattice in the fiber over B, um, so that the induced decomposition of the fiber into phi of P direct some phi of L is orthogonal with respect to the inner product on the fiber, QB. Um, okay, so the question is, is there some identification of the, of the fiber with Rn relative to the lattice, which is an important point, so that the induced decomposition of the fiber into a hyperplane and a line is orthogonal with respect to, to QB, um, with respect to the inner product on the fiber. And um, so if, one more bit of terminology, if this PL is not Q orthogonal at any point in the base, at any B and B, then we say that um, we say that PL is nowhere Q orthogonal. Okay, so this is the main notion that's going to lead us to a characteristic class. Um, so, um, right, so the, the question that you can ask um, is if you're given a bundle like this, does there exist uh, inner product Q so that uh, this PL is nowhere Q orthogonal? Okay, so that's the question you can ask. And we're gonna construct a characteristic class which obstructs the existence of, of such a Q. Um, okay, uh, so this definition is maybe hard to digest. Um, so let, let's do an example. Um, where let's just take B to be a point and see how this, what this condition is about. So we have a vector bundle of our point or we just have Rn and we wanna know if there's a inner product with some property. Um, so that this PL is, is not orthogonal with respect to, the, to that. So just looking at inner products on Rn, and um, so that is described by this symmetric space. So there's there's a bijection, I maybe should say unit volume inner products, but I'm just going to ignore that. Um, and so this is, this is given, you know, by sending a coset like this to the matrix, the inner product with this matrix. Um, okay, and then inside of here, you have uh, all of those inner products um, where this decomposition is orthogonal. with respect to that inner product. Uh, so this is like a subsymmetric space. Um, it happens to have co-dimension n minus one. And um, you can s maybe imagine now why this n minus one is appearing here. Um, 
that's going to be related to this. Um, and right, so now what, is, what does this definition mean? So the, the definition on the previous page, um, so for an inner product Q on this bundle over a point, um, which is just Rn, PL is nowhere Q orthogonal. Well, the nowhere is kind of silly here because B is just a point. So we just, the condition is just that PL is not Q orthogonal over the single point. Um, if, if and only if, well, Q is not in this subset. So let me give this a name. So let's call this H and let's call this X. Um, so Q is a, just an inner product element of X. And um, I don't want Q to be an H, but there's this issue of, I'm allowed to choose different identifications of the fiber with Rn, um, preserving Zn. So that's an element of SL and Z. So um, I want, Q to be in the complement, not just of H, but um, the orbit of S L N Z of uh, under H uh, of H under S L N Z. Okay, so you can imagine now if you have a larger dimensional base, you can think of this as, as sort of like finding. Um, well, okay, let me just go ahead and say. Um, ah. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to say one other th thing, which hopefully um, illustrates what this is about. I have a little picture here. So here's the case n equals two. Uh, so here the you have uh, hyperbolic plane, which is SL2R mod SO2. And um, I've drawn, so um, this is a, possible choice of H here. Um, these are all the inner products uh, so that the decomposition of R2 into E1 direct sum E1 over 2 plus E2 um, is orthogonal. Okay, so E1 and E2 are the standard basis and okay, I picked a particular line and um, that's where all of these inner products or uh, this decomposition, the inner products where this decomposition is orthogonal. And, and here's the orbit of that line under the action of SLNZ, SL2Z. So this is a, a familiar picture probably. Um, and um, okay, so the problem for bundles over a point is just to pick some inner product Q which is in the complement of, of all of this region. Um, and you can imagine that if you had a bundle over a circle, then you might have some trouble. And um, I mean, roughly what you're looking for is a fiber of, uh, yeah, let me not say that. Uh, okay, so let me come back to here and, um, uh, oh, sorry, one more thing about this picture. Um, so there's a fact, which is maybe a little bit easier to see in this picture, but it's true in general, um, that there exists a finite index uh, torsion-free subgroup uh, gamma in SLNZ so that uh, the gamma orbit of H is embedded in X. Okay, so here the gamma, the SL2Z orbit of this H is not embedded because these you have intersections here, but uh, if you pass to a finite index subgroup, then, um, then you can fix this problem. Uh, okay, so then now let me get on with the construction of the characteristic class. Um, so let's take such a gamma. Um, and take a vector bundle with structure group gamma now. 
So um, if this bundle admits uh, a fiberwise inner product so that uh, PL is nowhere uh, Q orthogonal, uh, then there's a section of a certain associated bundle. So you can form a bundle whose fiber is X minus the gamma orbit of H. Here's H, remember? Um, so now I just look at the orbit under gamma, the subgroup of SLNZ. And um, I get a bundle like this. And I mean, you could think about choosing a section of this bundle. That's, that's exactly to choose a fiberwise inner product, um, which is nowhere Q orthogonal. That's exactly what being nowhere Q orthogonal means. Um, so um, um, maybe I shouldn't say exactly. If there is a section, then um, you have a Q that's, that's um, nowhere. Um, what am I saying? Sorry, I'm mixing up the implications here. Uh, what I want to say is if you have this Q, then it gives you a section like this. Um, this bundle has a section. Yeah, maybe it doesn't work the other way around, um, but let me ignore that for now. That's not uh, the point. Um, so now, well, so let me just say that now using some obstruction theory, you can, I mean, obstruction theory is designed to give you cohomological obstructions to the problem of finding sections. And so in this situation, you can, obtained from this uh, a characteristic class CW in degree n minus one of, of, um, of the base space. Uh, n minus one, because that's the co-dimension. So you try to build up the section inductively over the skeleton, and then this is where you run into problems. And this characteristic class you can think of as if you choose like a generic section of this bundle, but where you uh, ignore this piece, um, then you just sort of count the intersection with, with, with this thing, um, with the piece that is removed here. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so let me try to finish up. Um, right, so this is, this is what I said I was going to do. I describe a characteristic class and, you, and give you some indication of what is it measuring. And there's a similar thing you can do for SOPQ. Um, and, but, okay, so what is unanswered is, um, in this discussion is, um, is this class non-zero? Uh, so, so here I'm, I'm viewing it as an element in um, HN minus one of, of B gamma. Um, so that is to say, is there some bundle where this uh, characteristic class is, is non-zero? Um, right, and that's not at all obvious, and that takes um, some work, which I'm not gonna say anything about. Um, but that's maybe the, yeah, I mean, that's maybe the meat of, of the theorem, is I've given you the construction, um, but now you have to show that you get non-zero classes and, and lots of them. And so, we, right, so I mean, you have this parameter of choosing this decomposition. And if you choose different decompositions, you can show that you get linearly independent classes, um, at least by passing to further finite index subgroups. Um, right, so this non-zero at the risk of making this board a little messy. Let me just finish on this board. Um, oh, that might be, okay. Um, so, uh, sorry, this is really disorganized. 
Um, let me move this up. Move this up, up, not no. Up, please. Okay, doesn't want me to move this thing. That's not what I'm trying to do. All right, sorry. Um, so the answer to this question, let me just say is, so yes, for SLNZ. Um, and let me just remark that this is a theorem of Avramidi and Fan. Um, although they, they don't state it in this language of characteristic classes. Um, and also uh, SOPQZ, so that's the main theorem. Um, but unknown for uh, the symplectic group. So showing this class is non-zero, it turns out to be a delicate thing. Uh, and let me remind you that here P is odd. Um, which just gives you some indication that this is not some just completely trivial thing that you build this character's class and there you go, it's automatically non-zero. Um, so I don't know the answer. You can build a character's class in a similar way for SP2GZ. And I mean, right, I mean, you could ask lots of questions like why did I choose a decomposition into a hyperplane and a line? And all of this goes into showing that the class is non-zero. Um, Okay, and then let me just finish by mentioning a problem which I think would be interesting, which is to um, relate it to this symplectic group case. Um, so it's to study, so for surfaces, you have the mapping class group of a closed surface, a genus G to the symplectic group. And um, we understand the induced map on cohomology in the stable range, um, but there's not much known about the induced map on cohomology um, outside the stable range. And well, one might guess that this would be an interesting source for uh, non-stable classes in, in the homology, the cohomology of the mapping class group, um, which is something that we don't know a whole lot about at the moment. Um, Okay, so I'll stop there and uh, thanks again for the chance to speak and for, for listening. All right.